Hello and welcome back to our third day of some Renaissance notes. Today uh, we are going to kind of finish up the Sistine Chapel. We have just watched the agony and the ecstasy and we saw what Michelangelo and Pope Julius went through to finish the ceiling. And if you remember the very end of the movie, the last challenge that Pope Julius says to him is, I would like a painting on the front of that chapel. And that's kind of where we start with our notes today. We will also be talking about uh, sculptures as well as architecture and that way if you need any of these notes you can skip ahead to whatever section you need okay all right so as you can see this is a picture of the entire Sistine Chapel and he did eventually finish the chapel he did start out by doing the tomb first because Pope Julius died shortly after the ceiling was done so he did that first and you saw that at the beginning of the movie and then he came back 30 years later. 30 years later, he did the front of the chapel. You'll notice that this is called the Last Judgment. And it's called the Last Judgment for obvious reasons, because this is the moment after you die where it's determined which direction you go. Now remember that this is a Catholic church, so they believe that there are three places that you can go. Up here, you'll see heaven, and if you look closely, you can see angels here and here and here, and they're carrying people up into the clouds into this beautiful place. On the bottom, we have H-E double hockey sticks, of course, and it's a very scary place. If you look closely at his characters, you'll see that these demon-like characters are, are dragging these people out down to the bottom, and they're scratching and screaming and trying to not have to go down to that horrible place. And in the middle, Catholics believe you can also go to, you guessed it, purgatory. Now, can anybody tell me what is purgatory? You're right. It's a waiting place. And what are you waiting for? Good. You're waiting to find out whether you go up or you go down. And they're going to weigh the good things you've done in your life against your sins. And if you remember in the movie, uh, Pope Julius actually says to Michelangelo, when I get to those pearly gates, I am going to use this painting against my sins to prove that I did something good in my lifetime. And uh, if you know anything about Pope Julius, he does have a few things to answer for. Well, for example, he killed a lot of people. He went to war if they didn't want to be Catholic. So he does have to account for that. The other thing he did, if you, uh, any of you go to the Catholic Church, do you allow priests to get married? Nope, absolutely not, right? Well, isn't it amazing that Pope Julius had a son? Where do you suppose that happened? No, it was not a virgin birth. Believe it or not, Pope Julius was doing a little bit of sleeping around. So he also got in a little bit of trouble for that too. So he's going to use this when he goes to purgatory. And if you go to some of those beautiful old churches in Europe, like uh, Notre Dame, for example, you can go in and you can light a candle and say a prayer for someone. Well, after somebody dies, the old school belief in the Catholic faith is the more prayers that you give for somebody, the more you're going to help them go from purgatory into heaven because they've done good things and people love them on earth. So you'll see there's people waiting. Now, who do you suppose is in the middle of this painting right here? Who's going to do the judging for God? Yep, Jesus. And then next to him is his mother, Mary. In the Protestant church, they believe that Mary is obviously the mother of Jesus. But in the Catholic church, it goes a little bit more so than that. They consider her a saint, and she is very, very important in the Catholic culture. So you'll see there in the center of this painting, now, by the way, this painting took him another four years to finish, just as long as the ceiling. And some people would actually say that this is just as beautiful, if not more beautiful, than the ceiling, because there's so much to see. And I will tell you, you can get a book, a thick book, with all kinds of stories about this painting and all kinds of famous people that are on this painting. Uh, for example, think about it. If he puts, uh, let's say, a king down in the area of hell, what do you suppose he's saying about that person? 
that maybe this person is evil or that's where this person is headed. So he was making some very political statements about people. Um, I'm going to give you just a few stories so that you have some knowledge about this painting. First of all, we're going to talk about this guy right here. Let's take a close-up of that. So notice we're down in hell. And you'll see here on the left side, uh, your demon-like characters. Now notice that Michelangelo is brilliant at doing the human physique. He's got the musculature just perfect. He's very good at it. He's been studying those dead bodies and cadavers like we talked about. But he's added claws and uh, pointy ears and all kinds of scary stuff. And you can see how they're carrying the people down from purgatory, dragging them down into hell. And the people, of course, are very afraid. This particular demon, however, is actually a guy named Sharon. Sharon is a mythical boatman, and his job in Roman and Greek mythology is to ferry the damned to hell, believe it or not. Kind of reminds me of a movie. How many of you have seen Pirates of the Caribbean? Great movie, right? Johnny Depp, so awesome in it, right? Well, in that movie, there was a character, and his job was to ferry the damned to the afterlife. Do you remember who it was? He had kind of a squid-looking face. Yep, you got it. Davy Jones. Davy Jones and his locker, right? And his job was to do exactly what Sharon did, although uh, Davy Jones is in the pirate world. Sharon is in the Greek and Roman world. Okay? Now I want to show you another scene from Down in Hell. If you look down here in this corner, most people don't even notice this, again, unless they read about it or study it. So you're going to know some things others might not. Uh, Michelangelo actually portrays the resurrection of the dead that you see over here, meaning the separation of the body and the spirit. And it's kind of freaky when you look at it. Here you'll see the human body, and the skeleton is kind of separating here, and the skeleton's going off into the spirit. And then, of course, notice you'll see the spirit here leaving the body. Same thing over here. Here's the human. Here's the body or the spirit. Here's a spirit leaving this guy. Another one here. Take a look at this. Sometimes if you look up um, this painting, you'll see a close-up of that skull. And people don't even believe that it's a part of the same painting. It's a very, very scary view of what life might be like. Because remember, those spirits are not going to a good place. So he doesn't want that to be a positive thing. All right, the next thing I'm going to show you is actually this right here. You'll notice that he's very close to Jesus, so he's probably pretty important in the Catholic faith. This is actually Saint Bartholomew. And if you look closely at what he has in his hand, he actually has in his hand a filleted skin. Well, the reason for that is because Saint Bartholomew was killed and there are three theories about his death. One is that he was beheaded, one said he was drowned, and the other said that he was actually filleted. He was skinned alive. So here you see Michelangelo has chosen that third version, and he's here waiting in purgatory with his skin. <laughs> but the interesting part about this painting is that this is actually Michelangelo. He chose to be that part of this painting. So now I want you to take a look at where this filleted skin is in location on the major picture. You notice that they are in purgatory, but which direction is that piece of skin going? It's going down towards hell. And some people believe, or art, artists, historians believe, that this kind of demonstrates what Michelangelo thought about himself and where he was going in the afterlife. He did believe that because he had um, feelings for other men. Whether he acted upon them or not, he felt that that was a sin and that he was damned to hell for those things. So very sad that he would see himself as, as flawed like that, I guess. Well, the last story I want to tell you actually has to do with both Jesus in the center and St. Bartholomew, along with a few others. Whoops, wrong way. <coughs> You'll notice that these gentlemen have a uh, cloth in just the right place so that their privates are not showing, right? But what would you say if I told you that when Michelangelo did this painting originally, 
all these people were naked. Everybody that actually looks like that was naked. So let's look at the original and see what it looks like. Those of you in front, do you notice, is anybody completely naked in this painting? Yes? Like, for example, right over here, these people are naked. Oops, there's my pen. And yet you see others are covered. So the story is, what in the world happened? Well, Michelangelo did this painting all naked, okay? Um, just like when he did the ceiling, remember the cardinals were mad at him for showing nudity? He did this painting, died, all good. Well, years later, a group of Catholics decided that they didn't like the fact that there was naked nudity on the front of the altar where they were worshiping. They call this the fig leaf campaign because they actually hired a painter to go and cover up all the private parts with a cloth or with little fig leaves. That's the name fig leaf campaign. The painter that actually did this is like destroyed for the rest of his career because a lot of people were very angry. They basically said he has ruined Michelangelo's painting. He's tampered with it and it will never be the same again. Okay. So he covered up all the nudity, but you just told me that there were people that were completely naked in the painting. Well, this is what happened in the 1990s. They had to restore the painting because they had to brighten up the colors and keep it going so that we don't lose it over time. So the question became, what do we do? Do we restore it back to the original version that Michelangelo wanted? Or do we cover up all those private areas? So my question is, what would you do? Would you keep them the way originally intended? Would you cover them up? Now, before you make that decision, I want you to imagine something today. So those of you that attend a church, I want you to imagine that you go into church on Sunday and up on the front altar of your church is a painting of J-Lo and Jennifer Aniston and Channing Tatum painted in the full nude. How do you think your church would respond to that? Yeah, I think there might be a little bit of trouble, right? I mean, oh my goodness. I think the old people in our church would probably have a heart attack. Now, someone said in the last class, they said, well, they aren't Bible people, so that's not the same. All right, so let's change the story. You go to church on Sunday, and you go up, and you see that there is a painting in the front of your church of Jesus and Mary and the 12 disciples all completely in the buff. Would that bother any of you? Well, you've just put yourself in the role that these people were in. Because remember, Michelangelo was not as famous then as he is now. I mean, he was good. But remember, he was new at that time, and that was a very rebellious thing to do then. It'd be a rebellious thing to do today. So what they decided to do, long story short, is they decided to do half and half. Half to demonstrate what Michelangelo really wanted to happen, and they also covered half to represent that the fig leaf campaign was a part of Catholic church history. Kind of cool, huh? All right, so let's take a look at Renaissance sculptures. I want you to highlight or circle this slide because you're gonna need it for your test, all right? So when we look at these sculptures, what things are we going to see that make it a Renaissance sculpture? Number one, classical influence, meaning they're influenced by the Greeks and the Romans. This is not the first time we have had uh, statues like this. The Greeks had them, the Romans had them. The only difference is the Greeks tended to portray them uh, overly done, overly muscular, like almost a, a god. Whereas in the Renaissance, it's about being as realistic as possible to make them look human. So we will definitely see that. Number two, we're going to see realistic looking faces and bodies. We've already talked about how they would cut open dead bodies or cadavers and study the musculature, study the, the veins, the bones, everything. Number three, symmetry or proportion. Now in this case, not necessarily so much symmetry as proportion. You'll notice the legs are the right size, the head is the right size to the body. They wanna make sure it's as real as possible. Number four, 
you will see movement or activity. Not always in a standing statue like here, but if you look down in this area, like in this sculpture, you'll see there's movement up in the sky there. And the fifth one is not on here. Freestanding statues. Meaning that we can see 360 degrees of the person. So when you go and see the original statue of David, or even the one in Sioux Falls, if you go behind him, you will see his booty, right? And if you go and study some of the, the sculptures in Florence, for example, you'll see that there are tons of people that love to draw, artists that just sit there, and they will draw these sculptures from different views. They'll sit on the side and draw them from the back. It's really kind of a new perspective. So let's look at a few examples. These two busts show us that we care about humanism and the individual, that this person is important. And we show respect for these people in sculptures by showing them as being powerful. There are two main ways why these guys look powerful. Let's see if you can figure them out. The first one is they show them with broad shoulders. But this person is strong underneath his clothing. His clothing isn't hanging off of him. He's a strong person. The second thing they did is they gave them a full, thick beard. I know that sounds crazy, but as full as it is, it does show power. Imagine if this guy over here had just like two little scraggly hairs. <laughs> He'd be looking like Shaggy on Scooby-Doo instead of some powerful general. So our first major example are Ghiberti's doors. Now I gotta tell you a story about this, it's so crazy. We were in Florence, I was on my first tour taking students, like some of you are gonna go with me this uh, in a couple summers. And we went to Florence and a tour guide was walking us around showing us the beauty of Florence and all these neat things. She brought us to this beautiful cathedral and we couldn't take our eyes off it. It was so gorgeous, made of complete marble, white, pink, and green marble. Beautiful. And so we're standing there listening. And one of my students, who was in this class, just like you are, said, this is Terpstra. Turn around. Look. And I turned around, and here's what I saw. She said, I think those are Gabardi's doors, aren't they? I said, I think you're right. So we went and we asked the tour guide, and she said, how in the world do you know about Gabardi's doors? And we very proudly said, well, yeah, we studied that in my class, blah, blah, blah. So then they gave us all these really cool stories. Part of the reason that they have not highlighted this on their tour is although the doors are in fantastic shape, the building itself is falling apart and it looks pretty rocky. In fact, it will take at least $2 million to renovate the building. So they don't typically use it on a, on a tour. So we actually got to see it. Now, when I pass this around, I'll show you the pictures of the beautiful cathedral. But if you take a look at this picture of the doors, again, I'm studying it from a picture, not from being there. I was amazed at how big they were. If you look at the picture, you'll notice that there are actually people standing in front of here. So this door is at least twice the height of probably our tallest guy, which is really cool. So let's learn a little bit about Caberti's doors. Okay, first of all, uh, we're in Florence here, and the city had a competition, and whoever won this art competition would be allowed to do the doors of the local baptistry. If you look at that name, baptistry, this is where their children are baptized in the Catholic Church. And this building is kind of a, I believe it's an octagon or hexagon, a round type building. So he was given the honor of building the doors. This set that you see here are the north doors. You'll notice that they're made out of bronze and they are Bible stories. So each panel represents a Bible story. Just this set of doors took him 20 years to finish. 
but it doesn't end there. There's another set of doors on the east side. And those took him 25 more years to finish. Think about how old you are right now, 15, 16. So think about how old you would be when you finished the first set, right? 35. And by the time you got done with the second set of doors, you would be probably 60 years old. Can you imagine spending 45 years on just one project in your life? That is perfection for sure. So let's take a look at a close up of one of these. We're seeing some things we've talked about here, some of our characteristics. Notice that we see depth. We see individualism in faces and bodies. We've got shading. We've got movement. We don't have symmetry. And obviously this is not freestanding, right? Because we can't see the back or sides. So those are our characteristics. Now this is actually a good example to show us a new technique that they used in sculptures for depth. If I wanna show depth in painting a picture of you guys in this room, remember I would make the people in the front row bigger, the people in the back row would be little, right? Well, in sculpture, you actually use an etching tool, and you'll notice that he does something to make those people stand out so they look closer to you. Can anybody tell what it is? Yeah, you're getting it. He's using his tool to dig deeper so that they almost pop out like a, a 3D picture. Yeah, he's digging deeper in relief. And then on parts like this up here, he's actually just etching really lightly on top of the bronze. I told you these were Bible stories. Can you tell which Bible story is represented? I'll give you a hint. The biggest clue is on the, uh, this side of the painting over here. Yep, it is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and you'll notice that the snake or the devil has been tempting them to eat the fruit from the tree. And at that moment, they have sinned. So the angels are coming down and God is basically kicking them out of the beautiful, sinless Garden of Eden. Good. All right. Our next uh, piece is actually three pieces. We are going to look at the three statues of David because we want to compare them and kind of look at what they have in common and what they have that are different. The first one was done by one of our Ninja Turtles, Donatello. Remember I said Donatello was a great sculptor. That was his talent. So he did this. This was done in the, oh gosh, late 1300s to early 1400s. Okay, so late 13 to 1400s. And this is the first of our three Davids. In fact, this is the first freestanding statue of the Renaissance. So he was the first to bring back this idea of a 360 degree statue ever since the old Greek and Roman days. Now in order to understand the differences and similarities, the first thing we need to do is understand who David is. Raise your hand if you have heard of the story of David and Goliath. I'm sure lots of you have run across this story, you know, somewhere. You may not know all the details, but it actually relates a lot to a movie that came out a few years ago. How many of you have seen the movie Troy with Brad Pitt? Yeah, cute guy. Boy, oh boy, he's so cute in that movie. Well, if you remember the very first scene, there's a huge army to your left and a huge army to your right, and two kings meet in the middle, and they've already lost a lot of guys fighting with each other, and so they came together and they said, I'll tell you what, you send your best fighter, I'll send my best fighter, and then whoever wins, wins the entire battle. We'll call it good. So if you remember the movie, on this side over here, the king brings out this gigantic guy that's foaming at the mouth, and he's swinging his sword, he's awesome, right? And on the other side, the king brings out his best fighter. 
<clears throat> which is Achilles. Now Achilles is probably half the size of this other guy, but he's agile and he's smart. So as he's being uh, thrown spears at and all that stuff and the big guy's coming at him, Achilles runs up and he kind of lifts himself up on the side of the, his enemy and he stabs the guy just behind the neck straight down at an angle so it goes right through the heart and it kills him instantly. Voila, Achilles King is now the winner. Well, this Bible story of David and Goliath, true story, is almost exactly like that. Back in Bible days, they did agree to have one person settle the battle because it meant less people dying, less people, you know, losing dads back at home. So in this case, the kings agree, yep, we're going to send our best fighter. Well, over here comes Goliath. And Goliath is as big as the rock, man. He's huge, muscular, strong, and he is known throughout all of the land as the best fighter in any army anywhere. And he's swinging his sword and he's ready to go. So the other king goes to his men over here and he says, who will fight for us? And what does he hear? Crickets, nothing. His best fighters won't step up because they're afraid that they're going to get defeated by Goliath. And then all of a sudden he hears a voice in the back of the army that says, oh, fight him. Well, he was 12 years old, so his, his voice was a little higher then. And sure enough, this 12 year old boy comes up and his name is David. And he says, I'll fight him. And the king says, there's no way you can. You're 12 years old. But here's what David said. David said, I have faith that God will protect me. Well, the king couldn't mess with that because you don't question God. So he said, all right. And you can imagine the king and the army are going, oh my gosh, we are so going to get beat here, you know. So David gets ready to fight, and you see Goliath here swinging his sword, and what does David get out to fight with? Yes, he gets out a slingshot or a pea shooter. Again, I'm sure the king was like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. So imagine the scene. They're basically head to head, ready to go at each other, and Goliath starts running at him, and he's swinging his sword, and David pulls back, boop, and he lets this stone go. And it hits Goliath right in the temple. You know that part where your parents say you'll die if you get hit there? Hits him, bam, he's dead immediately. Now it doesn't end there. At that point, David goes and takes Goliath's sword for his own, and he cuts off Goliath's head. So if you look at this statue, you're probably starting to figure a few things out. When was this statue representing? Is it the beginning of, like, before they fought? Is it during the battle or after? So let's get to that in a minute. All right, this statue is made of bronze. And what a cool thing. These guys all knew each other. Donatello was an assistant to Ghiberti. Remember Ghiberti's doors? So it's probably pretty logical that he would work with bronze because that's what he was taught with. This statue is five feet tall. So who's five foot in here? All right, so imagine people, this is how tall that statue would be, okay? Now let's look, how does Donatello portray David? What do you notice? Okay, so you'll notice that he is naked. And in case you're wondering, no, they did not fight naked. <laughs> So that was an artist's choice, okay? It's all right, go ahead and say it. Yeah, he looks a little bit feminine. Would you say that he is pre-puberty or after puberty? Yeah, he's before puberty. They're trying to show that he's young. He hasn't become a man yet, he's very young. Notice he's got long hair, he's got a hat on. Now the big question, does this take place before, during, or after the fight? You are correct. It is after the fight. How do we know? Exactly, because he has Goliath's sword and he also has Goliath's head under his foot. 
Good job, guys. All right, let's look at the second David. Hmm, some similarities, some differences. All right, this one is done by a guy named Baraccio. And it's kind of cool. Um, he did this for the Medici family. Remember Tosina Medici in our movie? It was done for their family. And so it was probably actually in their palace at some point in history. And Baraccio said that he needed a model that would pose for him while he did the statue. So he asked his assistant, his apprentice, to pose. Well, it just so happened that his assistant was Leonardo da Vinci. So believe it or not, this is a young version of Leonardo da Vinci. How cool is that? This one was done 1474, 73 to 75, excuse me. It is four feet tall, so it's about a foot less than the last one. And it is also made of bronze. Now look at how Veraccio portrays David. Would you say he's about the same age or is he older? Yeah, he's about the same age. So he is pre-puberty. He's dressed this time. He's got a soldier's uniform on. Still maybe a little bit feminine, some would say. Got the long hair. And again, the question is, where is this in the story? It is after. Good. Because again, we see the sword and we see Goliath's head. Now, an interesting thing about this statue, when they found the original, the head was not attached to David. So they honestly didn't know where it went. So if you see replicas, you're going to see it in different places. Some people believe because of symmetry, it should go on this side because of the way his head and his hips are, like a triangle, you know, that these should line up like this. Other people believe that because of the point on this outfit here, that it's pointing this direction, so the head should actually go there. That's our second David. Now let's look at our third one. Holy cow. A little bit different than the other two, isn't it? Very, very different. This is Michelangelo's. And this one took him about three years. He made it from 1501 to 1504. You'll notice this one is made out of marble. And it is 16 feet tall. So imagine, you know, our ceiling is probably what? 10, 12 feet in a typical room. So you would actually look up to look at this guy. He is huge. And if you remember in the movie, they said it's made out of one block of stone, one whole block. So it is gigantic. Now let's look at how he portrays David. He's nude. And he is definitely an adult male, isn't he? Because he's muscular. Shorter hair. So now the big question is, which part of the story is represented? Well, you'll notice we don't see a sword or Goliath's head or anything. I think this is the coolest thing about this statue. Michelangelo chose to portray David at the moment he chose to fight. And the reason I think this is cool is because Michelangelo said it didn't matter whether David won or lost the battle. The point is, he was victorious because he was the only one that was brave enough to stand up to Goliath. And number two, even more important, he was the only one that had faith in God. So he wants to highlight that moment. Now, if you look closely, you'll see that he has his slingshot here in his hand. But he intentionally made it so it wasn't obvious because he didn't want this to be about, well, a slingshot beats a sword in this story. It wasn't about that. It was about David being so brave. 
If you'll look at the detail, holy cow, it is amazing. Remember that he did this with a chisel and a hammer. Imagine doing the curls in his hair or the little features of his eyes and nose. Notice that there's veins in his hands, even the nail bed. You'll even notice up here, you can see his Adam's apple or even the vein in his neck. He has it down to perfection. It is a masterpiece, no doubt. So my last question for you on this statue, we believe, based on evidence, that the David that really fought was 12 years old. So why do you think Michelangelo portrayed him then as an adult male? There are some that believe that he was representing the fact that he had become a man at the moment he decided to fight. Some people will believe it represents him making a mature decision, a decision of a man at that point. Or just that the body shows his bravery of doing such a thing. Interesting. And plus, of course, Michelangelo loved the physique of a man. It was beautiful. So he wanted to highlight that as well. And that's why the guys used nudity in these statues. Good. All right. Our last segment is on architecture. So again, if I can get there, will you please highlight or circle this slide because you'll need it for your test. All right. When we look at Renaissance buildings, here are the characteristics. Number one, we're going to see classical influence again. Greek and Roman buildings. And when we say that in buildings anyway, we're talking about columns. Like you see here, right? And we're going to see arches that look like this, right? Number two, they were obsessed with mathematical precision. Before the Renaissance, they kind of put up a building, and if it stuck, it stuck. If it didn't, it didn't. But these guys are measuring everything to the nth degree. They're making sure that it is all symmetrical, it all measures correctly, and they are especially obsessed with a guy named Pythagoras, who actually was an old Greek philosopher, but he was obsessed with mathematics. You obviously know him from Pythagorean theorem. Right, good. The third thing you'll see as a characteristic in these buildings is the circle. They are obsessed with the shape of a circle because they believe it is the strongest of all the shapes. Now let me show you what I mean. Think of it this way. If I have a table that's made out of wood, about the size of your desk here, and I put an elephant on top of it. Remember, it's made of wood now, and it's a rectangle. Okay, what are the weaknesses in that table? Where are they going to break? Good. Some of you would say the middle, especially in a rectangle because it's not supported underneath. Good. Where else is it weak? When you're at home and you see little desks break or little things made of wood, they break in the, the corners, right? Because at the corner, we either glue it or nail it together, right? So that's a weakness. Now take a look at a circle. Does a circle have any corners? So automatically, we've taken out those weaknesses. They also found that if they use mathematics and they figure exactly uh, where each of the columns underneath that circle are to be placed, that it can hold basically any weight you put on top of it. Now, if it's a bigger circle, they would then put a column underneath the center of that circle, but it actually holds your weight much better. Think about when you went to the circus as a little kid. Remember they took an elephant and he stood up there kind of like on uh, one leg. I don't know if you remember this. I'm terrible at elephants. But here he's on one leg, right? And he's got his little paws up there and his trunk, right? <laughs> okay. What was he standing on? What shape? You're right. It was a circle. That looked something like that because it holds his weight the best. The fourth characteristic you will see, oops, sorry, oops, is symmetry. Mm -hmm. 
Remember, symmetry means the same on both sides. If I draw a line down the center of almost all these buildings, they will be alike on both sides. And I told you earlier this, this semester, there was one technique that they figured out during the Renaissance that they added for their own. What do you see in all three of these pictures? Right, a dome. They were the first to ever figure out how to create a dome. So let's take a look at some of our examples. All right, first of all, in this picture, what are the characteristics that you see? Symmetry, good, it's the same on both sides. We see columns, good. We see arches along the sides here, right? Excellent. Our first piece is the Cathedral of Florence. And this thing has quite a story to it. You know that I usually don't ask you to memorize dates, and you don't have to memorize them, but they are important to this story. So here's what happened. In 1294, a guy named Arnolfo di Cambio started making the cathedral or church of Florence. He studied the old Greek ways. He visited the Parthenon, loved that stuff. And he said, I want a low cupola in my building. One of your vocab words. Well, easy to remember, a low cupola is a cup-shaped dome. And he tried, and it would fall in. And they try again, and it would fall apart. And they tried and tried, and finally, he died, and they never figured it out. How crazy is this? Believe it or not, they even left the, the ceiling open because they couldn't figure out the dome, so they just left it alone. Well, now the date is 1418. Notice how many years have gone by. Florence had a competition. And they said, whoever wins this competition gets the honor of making the dome or creating it. And a guy named Bruno Leschi won. It's on your next slide if you need to know how to spell it. And he again was uh, very good with his math, with architecture. He studied the old Greeks and Romans. And so he starts working on that dome. And they kept working and kept working and he finally figured it out. How sad is this though? He never did see it finished. He died before it was done, but it was his design that they used. Finally, in 1474, the dome was finished. It took them 56 years to build the dome. So let's take a look at what it looks like. This is Brutaleshi's dome. Now the first thing you want to know, it is 370 feet above street level. So let's give you kind of a, a ballpark to give you an idea what it looks like. I got a question for you, you athletes out here. How many feet is a football field? Not yards, but feet. 300 is correct, nice job. So this is even taller than a football field height. You can imagine that, okay? And he used a technique that we call the herringbone technique. And as I would describe this when I first taught this, I kept referring to a children's toy. So let me show you what the herringbone technique is really. Raise your hand if you had a toy like this when you were a kid. Had the colored rings, that you put on this, this stand, remember this? Yeah, I even had one when I was a kid. That's really all the herringbone technique is. He would start out and he would build this portion of the dome this wide. And then he would build another part of it this wide and set it on top. And then this wide and so on until he got all the way so that it was close. That's really what the dome is. It's just making smaller, smaller circles all the way up until it's closed. That is called the hearing bone technique. He also used a technique called dome within a dome. 
because you have to have a way to kind of hold up that weight. So about halfway up, he makes a little, kind of a little platform here so that the top part of the dome had something to stand on. And it worked, and it's still standing today in Florence, Italy. Our second piece is St. Peter's Basilica. Now remember that this is the Vatican in Rome, where the Pope lives, right? And remember that the Pope's architect was a guy named Bramante. He was the one that actually did the building, but this dome was done by our guy, Michelangelo. I'll send around a picture here. This is a picture of St. Peter's Basilica. And if you look at this courtyard, this is where the Pope has mass every Sunday. He goes out on this little patio here and they have huge screens like you go to a rock concert. And he does mass with hundreds of thousands of people. And I got there afterwards because the, the traffic was like crazy. But you can take a look at that. So Bramante did the building and then he did the dome that you see there. Now this dome stands, oh gosh, let's see here stands 452 feet high. So it is bigger and taller than Brunelleschi's dome. And if you look at uh, state government buildings like the capital of South Dakota, Minnesota, that kind of stuff, you'll see they quite often use domes. And most of the time they use Michelangelo's design. It's pretty cool. Uh, this was actually started in 1546. It was one of the last jobs that Michelangelo did before he died, and it was finally finished in 1564. So it took them almost 20 years to do the dome. And we'll, we'll show you some other pictures here. Uh, Michelangelo also did this altarpiece here inside St. Peter's. And he also did what we call the nave. Now a nave, is a hallway that has this arch-like thing all the way down. Okay, see how that works? A couple of things about this. You'll see the dome is right here, right? So this hallway is going down towards your dome. Um, these are made of gold. In fact, when I visited there, there were two guys up on a scaffolding, and their job was to take a toothbrush and clean out every little crevice up there. Oh no, don't shut down on me. Sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, they were cleaning all that out. Now there are actually four naves, and they look like this. So here's one hallway, here's another, here's another, and here's another, and then the dome is right here in the middle. Take a look, what does it look like? Yeah, it looks like a cross. So if you fly above St. Peter's Basilica, you will see it is in the shape of a cross which is pretty appropriate considering it's the Vatican, right? How cool. Now, if you go down there and you look up at the dome, this is what you'll see. Beautiful. Again, you'll see lots and lots of gold. You'll see they're using a new invention at that time, windows, which brings a lot of light into there. And he's using a little different technique than Brunelleschi did. He is using what we call octagonal drums to keep it supported. And that's these things right here. It helps hold it up. Our last example for architecture is Bramante's Tempietto. Now remember, Bramante was the Pope's architect, right? So you saw him in the movie. And if you look at this picture, you'll notice that it's not very big. It is actually only 15 feet in diameter. And there's a reason for that. So if I could have one of you come on up here, and I want you to walk foot over foot, 15 feet. So you can get an idea. For those of you at home, it's basically just a little bit longer than my front whiteboard in my room, okay? This was done by Vermonte, but it was done for the king and queen of Spain. And their names were Ferdinand and Isabella. Do any of you recognize those names anywhere? I had one class guess it. 
Ferdinand and Isabella were the king and queen that paid for Columbus's voyage to the New World. Because Columbus went to the king and queen of England, and they said, no, we're not paying for your trip. So he went to Spain, and they are the reason that our country was founded, basically, or discovered. So you've heard of them before. Well, they hired Bramante to do this. It's basically a memorial. Because this is the site where St. Peter was killed. So it's not designed to be very big. It's more like a grave marker in some ways. You can go inside. There's a little area to go in and pray. But other than that, it's just designed to be looked at from the outside. And if you look at our characteristics, it is a really good example of Renaissance architecture. We've got columns. We've got a dome. Uh, we've got lots and lots of circles. It is symmetrical. Uh, it is perfect as far as measurements go. It is exact. So, And that is it for today. Thanks so much for listening.